Well, thank you very much for this. It's uh, my honour to meet someone who has worked on the Tomb Raider series. Could you just tell a bit more about yourself and the history of Core Design and how did you guys sort of start out? Yeah. Yeah, I can. Um, the history of Core and, and my history, I mean, back in the early 80s, um, you know, uh, games were an uh, amazing thing to be involved with and, and a company to be uh, part of. And my brother actually worked for a Sheffield company called Gremlin Graphics. Mm. And Gremlin um, produced some great old games and were very unusual back then that they had their own internal development. And Ian, who started Gremlin, decided one day that he'd had enough and he didn't want to continue with internal development. And um, that was the beginnings of Core. My brother said, I can see a great opportunity, I'll, I'll take this and, and you know, we'll start developing games as Core Design. Back in what I call the good old days, um, you know, they, it was a very different industry, different way of getting into than it is now, but also um, very, very creative, a lot of fun. Uh, what were your main inspirations um, when designing the concept for Tomb Raider? Did you take, um, or, and of course Lara herself, did you take any inspirations from other games at the time or previous projects, perhaps like maybe Rick Dangerous as a concept, perhaps, and use that? Yeah, uh, bizarrely enough, most people know us from Core. One of our early games was a game called Rick Dangerous, which, if you look, the similarities are, are, are frightening, albeit a sort of a side scrolling platform uh, based game. Um, you know, the time that we were working on Tomb Raider, which would have been sort of middle of 94 into 95 and 96 was a really interesting time in the games industry. Um, I, I think it was one of the pinnacle moments because for the first time ever, we weren't just looking at Sega and Nintendo as being the, the two people that we were developing games for, you know, along with coming this new player called Sony, who we all knew. And they had a, a very different approach to how games should be developed and, and the development kit and, and the environment that they gave you as, as a development studio to develop in was very different. I think also there was a change in, in culture. At 90, you know, 96 games became more mainstream. So people were generally interested. It was actually reasonably cool to play games uh, in 96. So the inspiration for Laura came from, from a number of reasons. It, it wasn't uh, you know, people think it was just a, it, it was just luck, I guess, more than anything. We sat around a table, we went away, um, we came back from uh, a show in Japan and we'd seen lots of great games and Jeremy and I said to the, to the guy in the office, look, you know, we've seen some amazing stuff, it's 3D, it's all going to be different, you know, the roadmap's going to look different, what are we going to do? And literally, two really came out from that meeting. Um, by the original team, which was a gentleman called Toby, Toby God. So we had this idea of, of a game featuring a protagonist and, and then on the character that were there. Um, and that was Tomb Raider, and he drew Lara as as we know her today within the first five minutes. And, and that was that's you know, and it was the same. She's standing on sort of a, the, the top of a cliff, she's in a short, she looks very similar to what she does today. That's crazy. Five minutes is that's I, I think yeah, he incredible. just he just caught it. He just sort of knew what he wanted Laura to be. Mm. At one point, we almost obviously a lot of people know that we almost got the name Laura Cruz. Yep. And um, instead of Lara Croft, which was just one of the things that was changed to adapt to and yep. help sell to an American audience. Um, were there any other names that we might have gotten instead? Um, were there anything else that didn't make the cut and had I, to get axed? I can't. I, I mean, th there's a number of. Uh, Sort of changes. Um, the game was always was always a female-based game, or we knew that the game was going to be a character-based game, and we knew that we wanted the player to sort of be this either the guiding force that was protecting and guiding the player, or the or the player was going to be the person themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and the last thing that we wanted to do when we were talking about it, and and what didn't feature in the sort of the original goals of the game was it didn't feature a, a character that had guns and was going around just shooting everything. And so when we wrote all these things down on a piece of paper and we looked at it, it was just like a eureka moment. We went, look, this is, this is a woman. It, it, it's not a man. As soon as we give a man guns, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. And <laughs> you don't care if he jumps off a high wall and you hear the crunch of his legs. You know, so it, it was a woman. And I think from that moment, that was the moment that, you know, we, we said, look, it's a woman. That's the moment that Toby drew Laura. And that's really the moment that she was born. But she was born being called Laura Cruz not Lara Croft, mm -hmm. um, because we thought um, the American market was important to us and we thought that was a very American name. And then we had a sort of an epiphany and went, hang on, surely if this is going to America, the Americans love Britishness, if there is such a word. They love us, our, everything about you know this country. So why would we make her American? We should make her typically English. And obviously it was a good thing that we did because the character herself has just remained not just an icon in game, but an icon for Britain as well, and pop culture. Did you ever predict the level of impact that Lara Croft would have on popular culture, or at least gaming in general, either? 
I'd love to say yes. I'd love to say we knew what we'd got. Um, I think we knew we'd got something special. Um, we showed it at a, a few consumer shows and a few sort of you know, uh, exhibitions and it was behind sort of closed door and, and the queue was 90% of the games industry of the time. You know, everybody from the games industry wanted to see this game which was developing. And we thought, wow, this is kind of strange. You know, so I think we came out of that knowing that we'd got something. We we never knew that we that the sort of the animal, the beast that we were creating, or, or the success that it was going to have. You know, it, it was a, quite an organic and a steady process as we were, you know, we were putting more and more things there. We'd be asking more and more questions about the character. You know, when's a birthday? And we're going. We don't know what a birthday is. Oh, Valentine's Day. Let's make it Valentine's Day. So suddenly, people had a vested interest to know more about this character that we were creating. One of the most iconic um, moments that definitely stands out for me when I played Tomb Raider for the first time, and a lot of people yeah. was the inclusion of the T Rex in the Lost Valley level yeah. in the original Tomb Raider. Now, what led to that becoming included, and were moments like that something that were important to you when designing Tomb Raider and future Tomb Raider titles? Um, I think. Um, I think we, were, you know, around the time we got a lot of influences, things like Jurassic Park, and and we always wanted to to, to focus on the on the fantasy esque type element, this real person exploring these worlds that, as an individual, I could never get to go to, and we really wanted to mix it up a little bit. So for us, you know, putting in the T Rex, it was such a, an iconic, you know dinosaur of old, it was so big, it was so massive and, and to, to have no idea that was going to be there as you ran around the corner and suddenly there was a T-Rex there. We, we started quite early on with the, um, the, the, the little raptors um, and they weren't threatening enough and we didn't feel they, were, they had enough impact. And then from that we said, why don't we put a T-Rex in there? And it gave us all sorts of problems that it was the biggest environment and the highest scene that we had to have in the cliffs. But it was just that, it was just that moment. The moment we said it, we just said, yeah, that's exactly right. Let, let's put a T-Rex, it's gonna be so great, so unexpected. And what do you do when you come face to face with a T-Rex? You run. <laughs> I certainly did. Yeah. <laughs> from the inception, what was the biggest hurdle that you had to overcome when trying to design this game, bring your concept of two to life. I think everything. Um, I, I think it was it was. Um, and look, you know, I was part of a team, and uh, I was very lucky that everybody shared a very common vision, which happens, you know, hopefully often, but but not always. So you know, everybody on the team, and we were a small team. It was only nine people the original two maybe team. Um, you know, an amazingly talented team, and everybody bought into it, and everybody wanted actually to try and produce something different. But it was it was the timing of it. You know, we had all played amazing, great side-scrolling platform games and sort of top-down ISO games, but really going to a full 3D world, it was just the problems. That it was the meetings that would sit in for hours thinking, well, what happens when Laura walks through the door and the camera's still in the room here? It was just the fact that we'd never done it before and, and, and the industry hadn't seen it before. I mean, it's just so easy now, it's so accepted. But then it was really all about how do you make this game playable when, it, when it's a character that's moving in the 3D world with a 3D camera. And it sounds so simple now, but at the time it was all new. And, you know, we didn't know the answers to it all and we'd spend a, a lot of time. It, it wasn't about the technology, it wasn't about the visuals, it was literally about how we made the gameplay, you know, a character in a 3D world that you control. So the first game took you to Kirk Caves in Peru, it took you yep. to valleys and did. Greece, and even a flesh-covered pyramid. It did. Uh, which was really freaky. It was. And then Tomb Raiders 2 and 3 took you to places like Venice and more yep. urban environments like Area 51. Yep. How did you approach, uh, you and the team, approach bringing each of these locations to life and what made you choose where to send Lara to next? Well, I think the original game was was it was really easy because it was it was fantasy. It, it was all wouldn't it be great to go to the pyramids of Egypt and the temples and the tombs and the Indiana Jones type raving and, and so it was it was it was really simple. I think the second game was a little bit harder, and partly because we didn't know the first game was going to be as successful as it was, and then the expectation on the second game was really hard. And it's like, well, what what do we do? Where do we go? We can't just go back to more temples and. You know, because that, we, we sort of seen that. So we sat and had a, a long, hard think about uh, locations that, you know, have a little bit of mystery, and that, which is why we thought of places like Venice. Mm -hmm. And it also had a great mechanic because we could put Lara in a boat. And, you know, we thought, no, no one's seen her in a vehicle, so let's put her in a boat. We didn't want to put her in a car, so let's put her in a boat. And then we had the Skidoo level, 
which was which was you know we kept totally under the radar. I don't think we showed anybody the skidoo level, and we're all playing the skidoo level in the office again. This is really great, yeah. And really, we just wanted to release something that was that was just very different. So I think the second game was. Um, by choice, quite different on, on the locations that we went to. And the first game also, it didn't have a massive story. I mean, you know, I know this story, and the story was one paragraph in the design document, and the design document was about 12 pages, so it shows the sort of the level that it, it captured the essence of it very easily. But we didn't have much of a story, so suddenly people were interested, and we had to start to invent a story. We had to give her a pass, right. you, you know, why she was doing what she was doing, and why she was motivated to do it. And that also helped us ground some of the locations a little bit. What um, other games, were there any other games that influenced that you sort of took inspiration from at the time, or was the, what was it you tried to I aim think, for? I think there were loads of games. I mean, you know, 95, 96, suddenly you wish. There's all these new games released onto the market, you know, let's say 96 to the launch of PlayStation and uh, uh, the Dreamcast, uh, no, Saturn side crumbs, you know, uh, and then suddenly the, the genres of games, these new genres of games coming. So people were doing uh, some amazing stuff and it was quite interesting. We ran our development concurrent to um, to the Metal Gear Solid franchise mm -hmm. and um, our friends at Sony, uh, the people that would come and visit us would also be visiting and the people at Metal Gear over in Japan, and they'd come to us and go, oh, they've got snow. Oh, oh, oh they've, got, they've got snow, right. You know, so um, it, it was quite interesting. There was all these sort of things that you were hearing about going on. So I think the influence came from many, many of the games at the time. And, and I, think the, I think we were quite late on, on, the, on the story. We, we employed towards the latter stages a script writer, um, a guy called Murti, who wrote, you know, the whole of the Tomb Raider history um, he turned it into books, and we t we used a tiny, tiny, tiny part of it. But you know, he he went away, and he he thought about things that we'd not thought about. He thought about why these people were connected, and he he connected all the dots together. The dots for us were just literally a bunch of random ideas that we threw down very early on, and went, yeah, it's Laura. She's a woman. Her birthday's here. She wants to climb up Everest. You know, there were there were in you know not connected things, and he started to connect them. You guys were churning out a Tomb Raider game, a new Tomb Raider game, almost for eight years straight. That's right, yeah. Did it, um, I mean, how did you guys ever meet such tight deadlines? I mean, was it, it must have been tough. It was incredibly tough. I, I would be really naive to say that it wasn't. Um, and it was, you know, the, the team, we worked silly, silly hours. And there was a number of things that I look back now and think, you know, we were mad. We, we had a, a big studio and core design, and we were working on other games that we were equally as passionate about, and Tomb Raider. And in actual fact, the irony of what we should have been doing is we should have just been working on Tomb Raider. We should have put every single person within core to be working on Tomb Raider as opposed to working on five or six games and spreading ourselves a bit thin. Um, and I look back now and think we were mad. We should have had two teams. We should have had one team doing one year and, and the other team, you know, you know, piggybacking that so that you know we'd always got development. You, we would finish a game. We would take you know a month or so off on holiday, and then we would um, we would come back and for nine months we'd, we'd hit it hard, six seven days a week, late hours, everything that um, that I wouldn't do now um, because I think it was it, it was it was a time when we were all really enjoying it and we sort of thrived off a little bit. But you also realise it's it's that there's a better way of doing it, and which is sort of planning and getting it right and you know so as fun as it was um it was it was massively hard but you know um we were so encouraged by what was happening and people did continually take to the games and enjoy the series of games and one of the big things that was uh, that did happen at the end of two men the last revolution yep. almost in response to this tight deadline was that lara was seemingly killed off obviously it was left ambiguous but yeah. there's no concrete yes she is or no she isn't <laughs> Um, then you had games like Chronicle that came out to yeah. sort of cement that a little bit, and then you've got Two Men of the Angel of Darkness that came out straight after. Yeah. Um, what was it that motivated you guys to keep going? I mean, all of this was this a decision that was a little we bit out of your finish. hands? <laughs> we actually thought the third one, will we finish, we'll, we'll leave it on this cliffhanger and we'll walk away into the sunset and never <laughs> touch another Tomb Raider game. How wrong were we? Mm -hmm. um, we honestly did. I mean, I think. Um, from the first to the second game, um, we changed. The, we didn't change the team, but uh, a lot of the original core team didn't want to do another two major two game for whatever reason. Um, so we had a, a different team on two, um, and then on three there was some new people came in. 
and you know, invariably the teams were getting larger and larger and larger. And we got to three, and we thought we've 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 probably done everything that we can. We don't really want to go any further. Um, and it was a very conscious decision. We thought we'll just leave it at that and we'll walk away. Um, we didn't, <laughs> for a number of reasons. Um, I think you know, uh, Idos. The importance to Idos was, was, you know, keep the franchise going. There was still life, and we thought that people would have had enough of Lara by the third game, and, and they hadn't. Um, and we did have a massive meeting, um, sort of in January. We all came back, and it was like, well, are we going to do another one, or what are we going to do? And there was enough motivation within the team to say, actually, do you know what? I think there is somewhere to go. There is something to do that we haven't done. So Lauren herself, going back, is um, was created very much to be a role model for young women to aspire to. Um, I know that Toby Gard was especially defensive of her her depictions and yep. objectification yeah. and marketing. Yeah. Um, how did you approach this when designing future titles for the series? Was balancing people's perceptions of Lara with your own vision something that you found difficult? Um, yes. Um, I mean, we always said, and, and people have commented on Lara for a long, long time, um, you know, this was a video game character that uh, you view from behind. Um, and you needed to be able to see that this character wasn't just a cylinder. So the only way in, in the, you know, the, the great ways of doing cartoons is to overemphasize, you know, and, you know, when Tom and Jerry did hit his foot, his foot would grow so ridiculously big. So you knew he'd hit his foot. And we had exactly the same problem with Lara, which is why we gave her a, a tiny, tiny way. So you would see some shape in her from behind because we were dealing with a character that we had to model out of 200 polygons, which is, you know, today what people use in a, in a fingernail of a character. That was our whole character. So we, we had to take liberties and, and, you know, some of those liberties actually forced the shape to look weird from different angles, but it was, it was it's a trick of the eye, really, if I'm really honest. But then, yeah, that spawned lots of controversy about Laura as a character and was she a good role model or a bad role model. I mean, for us, she was always a very strong, independent female that knew her mind. You know, it was that girl power time. It was that Brit pop culture. It was, and there was, you know, we, we liked the character. We were probably a 95% male organisation, you know, that all play video games. And to have a female character was really different, you know, and, and even I remember Hours before we were going to the final version, people were saying, you know, please have an option, male or female character, you know, don't just make your own female character. But we were so adamant that it was the right thing to do for the game. It was a different experience that we stuck by it. But um, it was difficult times. But I think on balance, um, everybody talked to the character and, and, you know, understood that that was the character that we were creating. So working on Tomb Raiders 1 through to Chronicles. Yeah. Um, you guys used the same engine for each of them, just basically we did. built upon that to make it more refined and retain a certain level of fidelity and increase yep. that quality yep. um, to work within the confines of PlayStation 1 hardware. Then came the PlayStation 2 and the challenge to develop on a new set of hardware but at the cost of a new engine that you guys didn't know much about. So what were the main challenges when approaching that when developing Angel of Darkness? Um, there were massive challenges. A lot of, you know, um, we were in a very, very fortunate position that um, we had a franchise that some of the hardware manufacturers were really important to them. Great games and all good games sell uh, consoles. Um, you know, they invest hundreds and hundreds of billions of pounds in developing these consoles. And if the publishing and development community don't support them, and it's very difficult to get gravity. So, so we were very, very well looked after. And that was going to primary at that point, it was for us with Sony. You know, we were not many people remember, but we launched the uh, the Sega version of uh, Tomb Raider um, about two months clear before we launched the PlayStation version because we were very loyal to Sega. We had an amazing relationship with us. We wouldn't have been as a successful company if we were without the support of Sega in the early days. And you know, so they had that window of opportunity. We invested very, very early. We were treated very well by Sony, and we were given access to the hardware very, very early on. Um, in development and if I'm really honest that was probably the worst thing that we did because the hardware was a constant moving target so for us we, we spent a good probably 12 months looking at the hardware and looking at what we want and it was moving all the time but for all the right reasons so it, it meant that we we sort of almost lost 12 months and, and got to when it was a stable machine and then went actually we're better off just to almost start again the challenges for us are always less about you know the visual quality because all the games should look similar and, and the engine um, 
I think the challenges were about how the content was delivered and the whole sort of episodic thing was very, very spoken about a lot. Oh, it's got to be episodic and you know how people are going to consume games and play games are going to be very different. I don't think a lot of that happened. Uh, a lot of it was talked about, but I, th I still think that that machine was still very much, you, you went and bought your disc and you put your disc in and you played your game. So yeah, difficult. Laura changed, more polygons, she becomes slightly more real, which we were never that happy about. She was always a bit of a cartoon character to us. She was always simple, manga, big eyes, you know, very simple face, but suddenly people start to scrutinize how the characters look because they can, because they need to look so much better. So I think you lose a little bit of the original style, gets gets rubbed off just a little bit because they also become a little bit more human and maybe that's not what we're trying to create in video games. Those challenges come up every five years in, in, in the console industry, you know, the, as, the, as the hardware goes round. Mm. And I think, you know, your focus in development has to change because where we could focus about developing tools which, create, which gave us environments and games, areas to play very quickly because they were just blocks. Suddenly that, that it, it, it's, you know, tiny, tiny details, tiny, tiny details that people will never see. So you invest 90% of your time and effort on a room that people just walk straight through. Whereas we've invented 90% on a room that was just about playing that room. Out of all the Tomb Raider games that you've worked on, what would you say are you the most proud of and would consider to be your personal favourite? Um, it's, a really, it's a really difficult, I, I, I would say it's probably not a part of the game. Um, there were some great parts of the game and, and, and the T-Rex for me was was a highlight just because mm. it was a shock. I remember being called down to Rome and I went, yeah, what's on? And I went, Christ is a T-Rex, you know, it was a shock to me, so I knew that. So things like that I, I, I really uh, enjoyed. For me, more than anything, um, because of my role within the team and, you know, not programming and not creating, you know, modern Lara, um, I was most proud about, I, I had children of the same age, uh, my son, and it was four, nearly five when we launched the first Tomb Raider game, was, was going to uh, the Derby branch of Toys R Us on the Saturday that we launched and seeing a queue of people standing there with their Tomb Raider in their hand ready to purchase. I mean, that was, it's a very proud moment. Mm -hmm. I've been in that queue and them, and them not knowing me from, from Daffy Duck. So for me, it, 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 for me, that's the, the proud moment that I had that, um, you know, 20, two years on, uh, something that we created, which was just, we thought was going to be a great fun game. And um, she's still going. Mm. And she's now in the hands of um, someone else. Yes. Now she's been moved on to Crystal Dynamics has, and yeah. Square Enix. Yeah. Just um, on another note, I mean, how does that make you feel? I mean, have you, <laughs> is it something that you've, you look at frequently? Honestly, no. No. Um, I, I invested so much of my time and my family's time and my children's time growing up and, all, and as we all did, from Tomb Raider 1 to 6. Um, and I feel immensely proud of uh, what my, uh, my small contribution and the team's contribution to bringing the franchise to the market. And it, it was very much, as I said, a, a team effort. It's not that I don't have an interest. I, I, I want to sort of in, in, enjoy the time that I had then. So I, I don't look that much at, at the new games. And partly also because how I play games has changed significantly from how I used to play games and the types of games that I play changed, I've become a far more casual player of games. Um, so I'd rather remember, sadly, Laura in through the eyes of my experiences between Tomb Raider 1 and Tomb Raider 6. So if you could go back um, to any of the point of developing any of the Tomb Raider yeah. games and change anything, yeah. if anything, what would that be? I think if most of us that worked on the team for the last Tomb Raider game that we worked on, uh, we would not release the game. Um, we still had a lot of things that we wanted to do, we still had a lot of levels, we still had a lot of content to go in, and we released the game far too early. This is Angel of Darkness. It is, yeah. Um, I think we had a great game in there. We were really excited about introducing another character in Curtis, and we had a, a real good idea for where Curtis could go in his own journey or crossing journeys. Um, and th that's what I would do. I would, I would, I would wind the clocks back and I would say, um, no, the game's not finished, it's not ready. Um, you know, we want another, however long it was, and uh, to, to get it to where we want you to. Um, and I think that was pressure of the markets at the time, pressures from a number of different factors, and, and it was what it was, but I just think um, that's what I'd like to do personally. What has been your biggest challenge in the industry, not necessarily being related to Tomb Raider, 
Um, it could be if it is, but what has been? Um, my biggest challenge to the games industry. I'm, I'm still here. I'm a dinosaur of the games industry. I mean, there are very, very few of us that are from from the old times, um, which is quite interesting. There was a time in the games industry when I think it lost its soul a little bit, in my opinion, and it's just my opinion. It, it, it lost its direction. Um, it went from being, um, you know, as we were talking about, you know, people that you employed that, which, you know, had games ideas and wanted to develop games, and it, it was their passion and it was their drive and it was their motivation, and they would pay us to work for us. You know, when it went from that to being to being an industry, which it actually was, but a, a proper professionally run industry, and that stamped for a period of time a little bit of the creativity out of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that that's gone now. It just changed. It went from as it needed to change because it, it became a global business it wasn't just a little cottage industry you know um, and it changed and for a period of time I, th I think for me it lost its way a little bit and maybe that was me losing its way within the industry I, I, I don't know um, so I think that was the biggest challenge um, I'm massively excited about the, where the market is today I think current console games are you know they're amazing and, and I can look at them and appreciate the the effort and the work and the hours and the organisation and the structure that's gone into create you know uh, the, the games that we're all playing at the moment. I'm sure. Um, I'm not so sure it's somewhere that I want to be because it's it's it isn't focused for me. I'm still very focused on the core, the essence, what makes it great to play and why I want to play it again. But then now we have mobile games, yeah, which which fulfil a lot of that. It, it, you can still rapidly prototype ideas. You can still proof ideas out, you can get them out to a very different audience um, out there. You can produce games that you'd never think of releasing on consoles or... Um, so, uh, you know, at one hand you've, you've still got that industry, but another you've got something which I still think is also emerging. I think, you know, um, it's the tip of the iceberg on, on the mobile, what they can do, what they're capable of doing. What um, games do you play today now that you're sort of moved to more casual? What games have stood out for you? I, I used to be... Uh, an avid player of whatever I could get my hands on and, and now I, 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 I'm totally opposite to everybody here in the company insofar as for me, it, you know, I follow people, I follow somebody on the tube and it was a young lady and she was playing the game for five minutes and she's walking, going down the escalator and I, and I thought to myself, you know, that, that's the consumer that we want, if that's the person, you know, the, the people that are, are playing games in, in small pockets we playing them repeatedly, you know, finding something within a game that drags them back time and time again. Console games tend to grab you and, and hold you for long periods of time, and um, whereas you know in, nowadays it's it, it's much it's much shorter. So I I will play anything I get my hands on. Um, I tend to surface the the store with no idea what I'm looking for. I'll look at the the you know the apps every Thursday they come out and see what catches my eye and randomly click on it and just play it. So really broad, really, really mm. broad. I, I, I play very successful commercial games and I play some very strange games just to try and understand why they're doing what they do. So, so very broad palette then. Really broad palette, yeah. yeah. And, and um, I, if I have to pick a game, I still love a shooter. I still, I'm still an old arcade player. I still like playing, you know, pick it up and play, you know, shoot stuff. You know, not too much brain power involved. Bit of doom. Yeah, bit of doom. I'm a big fan <laughs> of doom. Yeah, you know. So, and I still think some of the old ones are the best for for the same reasons. It was the simplicity of the game mechanics that, that the focus was on. And so, one last question. Yeah. I didn't send this to you because I wanted That's to get right. your initial reaction. Did you ever lock the butler in the freezer? <laughs> Repeatedly. <laughs> we all did. <laughs> that was the most fun of it, wasn't it? <laughs> it was, it was. I thought, what, who decided that that was? <laughs> How did that come to be? I, I wish I could answer that one. I have no idea whatsoever. It was inspired. Whoever came up with brilliant. it, it was just brilliant. It was, it was absolutely fun. We all did it. It was the first thing that we all did without actually being told. <laughs> brilliant. Well, Thank you very, very much for your time. I hope it's all recorded and everything. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, and Jim, nice Thanks to see you. Very much.